Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit WorldAfropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. WorldAfropedia.com Our skin color was beaten into us as nothing but pure evil. We were to be ashamed of it. We were illegitimate. Our mothers were whores. Our fathers were savages. And we had to, and we had to pay for those sins. Do you know anything at all about your parents? Basically, no. Easier to break through CIA, KGB files than to get through information on my background. <laughs> From I was a little girl, I knew I was black. At the age of four and a half, I knew what the word nigger meant. They just don't see your Irish side. Listen to me, I'm speaking with a Dublin accent. Countless children in Ireland suffered abuse in institutions run by the Irish Catholic Church. But this is the story of the illegitimate children born to Irish mothers and African fathers in the 50s and 60s. The abuse and racist treatment of these children has never been acknowledged by the Irish Catholic Church or the Irish state. And the secrets of their identities remain hidden. We didn't look like a community, but we are a community. You know, we are there, you know, we are in Ireland, you know, we are experiencing racism. People discovered they had their mother only died a year ago and they've been 40 years searching and given the impression they had no parents. Unbelievable uh, miscarriage of justice. And nobody seems to accept responsibility for this. The state just devolved all powers around education and childcare and health to the religious. The state didn't want to know. The nuns and priests had complete control. They were like gods. Mixed race illegitimate children were very rarely put up for adoption. The majority were placed into industrial schools. These are institutions run by the Irish Catholic Church to care for children. They used euphemisms like convents or orphanages. They were industrial schools. They were like workhouses. The last thing that they had in these places was love, care, attention, or the welfare of a child. When you've been in an institution for 18 years and you've been called nigger, wall, gollywog, beaten, stripped, sexually abused, you know why you're there. You know you're there because your mother didn't want to, to look after you. I never met my father. I was never interested in meeting my mother, if I'm really honest. Rosemary has spent her adult life trying to trace records of her father. But it's almost impossible to find anything because all information about him has been redacted by the Irish state. At three, I was sent to these, this dreadful couple. I've got a letter somewhere. This is where she says that we are rotting her beds. I'm not keeping them any longer. longer. Yeah, we are filthy, dirty. We're, we're three years old. Rosemary now lives in London and has decided to travel back to Ireland in an attempt to search for information about her father. 
This is the first time in 40 years that she will go back to St Joseph's Industrial School in Kilkenny, where she was abused as a child. From day one I was picked on. The daily micro humiliation designed to keep you in your place because you're not one of us. You need to be grateful you're even here. You're not as good as the rest of them because they're white. They're white. Scrubbing the colour off my skin. Not being allowed to have a bath first. The water would get dirty. That's what Kilkenny means to me. But it also means meeting my son's father. Meeting a man who gave me love for the first time. context of white supremacy Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy today's date Sunday March 19th 2017 so I have been told uh, this is our once a month global Sunday talk on racism uh, we always try to encourage uh, non-white people from different parts of the world uh, to dial in, uh, share their views. I think it's important, uh, number one, to grasp, think of, conceptualize uh, the problem of white supremacy as a global problem. Uh, this is not, you know, an issue uh, that is isolated to just, you know, a few uh, tough spots in the U.S. Uh, maybe it was an issue in South Africa from time to time and, you know, might somebody might call you a name every other month or so. That is not what this is. We are on a planet that is dominated. It doesn't matter what part of the globe that you're in. The sound cl uh, clip that you heard at the beginning of the program, non-white people in Ireland uh, talking about their experience with racism, white supremacy. There is nowhere to run. Uh, we have to, we being non-white people, victims of white supremacy, uh, we have to just try to get as much information as we can uh, about this problem, accurate information, what racism, white supremacy is, how it works, uh, and then try to really commit ourselves to solving this problem ASAP. Uh, and that's why we do this broadcast, uh, to get information, perspectives uh, from non-white people in different parts of the world about the problem of racism, exchange views. We can see some of the similarities and contrasts uh, in how the system works, depending on where you happen to be around the world. Uh, we certainly encourage uh, listeners in the states to dial in as well you can take advantage uh, and ask questions uh, really anybody wherever you are but certainly folks in the states uh, we normally have uh, predominantly people in the u.s uh, calling in to share views take advantage time where you can uh, speak to folks who are in different parts of the world uh, and get their perspective their thoughts uh, on racism white supremacy and anything you might have been curious about uh, this program is only 90 minutes so make sure you don't uh, lollygag and wait till the last moment if you have a question, uh, go ahead, get your hand up. Uh, first few minutes or so, we'll probably be chatting it up with uh, the folks from outside the states, but we will get to our callers as well. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Welsing's birthday uh, was yesterday. See if any of the folks uh, joining in have any comments that they want to get to on that. Uh, and there are other issues dealing with racism, white supremacy. Uh, seeing who we have with us uh, thus far, might have to add folks as we go. Uh, African 1884, joining us uh, live from Austria. You with us, sir? Yes, I am. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Uh, did Anything that you wanted to get in, Dr. Welsing's uh, birthday, the sound clip we heard about uh, the abuses in Ireland, or anything else that you wanted to get in as we start off? Uh, nothing, sir. Nothing. For sure. Uh, I think we have June Allen, uh, host of uh, the podcast, uh, her own podcast, where she talks about racism, uh, white supremacy. Uh, she had me as a guest on uh, her program uh, recently, just earlier this month. We talked about uh, Dr. Frances Cress Welsing, her work, her views on racism, white supremacy. Uh, it was great to get that in uh, to recognize her birthday. And her podcast is all uh, dedicated to racism, white supremacy. I posted the link uh, on the Facebook page uh, just mere hours ago. Uh, June Allen, you're with us as well? Yes, yes, I'm here. Um, well, I'm a little, my throat's a little bit hoarse, so you have to forgive me if I sound a little bit croaky. But yeah, I'm, I'm here and um, grateful to be on the show again. And yeah, it's great to have you on the on the podcast. I've had some great feedback about it already. So thanks again for, for, um, for coming on the show. It was, it was an absolute pleasure. It was great. 
Oh, for sure. It was grand being on uh, the broadcast uh, to share about Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Again, it's linked on the Facebook page. It's on my Twitter uh, page as well. So either or you can go and uh, catch the link to it. If you get really confused, just go to JuneAllen.net. And I'm sure you will find it should be pretty close to the uh, top of the page. JuneAllen.net. Net. Uh, now, I thought I dialed our other folks uh, who are joining us. I uh, might have to redial some folks, some of our other folks that I, I dialed in, Mr. Fox or uh, our caller in Sweden. Are you on the line with us yet? Just making sure. Okay, I figured I might have to do some redialing uh, that I missed folks, uh, didn't get them in or what have you, but we will manage as best we can uh, moving through the broadcast. Um, I guess to start out with, uh, lots of uh, different things that I wanted to make sure that we uh, touched on. Um, I guess the, let's see, what's the thing we should try to get, get rid of? I want to uh, make sure that the amount of time spent on what happened with Samuel L. Jackson, uh, his commentary about British actors, uh, is appropriate, meaning that was not the biggest priority on the planet over the last 30 days. I uh, did want to take advantage since we have uh, folks joining us from Europe and England specifically to speak to the issue, but that is not the uh, biggest issue. I guess before I get to that, um, I did want to put out, this is for anybody, folks in the States, our international uh, callers, participants, um, Congressman Steve King, he's a Republican, he and uh, Steve Bannon, he's a part of the Trump administration. Uh, many prominent whites, they have been mentioning the book uh, Camp of the Saints. This is a novel that came out uh, in the 1970s. Uh, it's similar to the Turner Diaries, if folks uh, have read that. It's one of those kind of racist works uh, where it's basically, hey, the problem, Negros, non-white people in general. Uh, they could ruin everything that whites have built up. We got to be vigilant. We got to be on our task and making sure that these non-whites do not get out of hand. Uh, that's the basic premise of the book. Uh, and if we're not on our task, uh, they'll just they'll ruin everything. They'll be raping our women. The whole nine. It's like I said, Turner Diaries. There are lots of, of books in this genre, uh, in my opinion. If folks have any thoughts on that book, because I think Ma uh, Le uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, she's one of the front runners uh, for the French presidency. Their election is a little later this year. She also, uh, it's a French novel, she also has been referencing this text and uh, people widely consider her party uh, to be racist or her to be uh, racist. She was on CNN, I mean, excuse me, 60 Minutes uh, earlier this month. Um, he also has been referencing this book. My question was, any of our listeners, if you have a thought as to why these books are so popular, what's the point of why racists write these books uh and and even this question was asked if white people i've taken the position that whites are not ignorant about racism why would they need books like this uh to influence their behavior or their thinking about racism why would they even need such a book uh if they're already a plus students of what white supremacy is how it works and what's expected of them as whites uh folks can think about that listeners our international uh callers as well if you have thoughts on that i would love to hear them um before i uh push off and get other commentary uh one of our listeners she was not able to call in but she said she wanted to contribute this to uh the segment today uh this was from the bbc this was published uh on march 15th black counselors at women's day event asked are you cleaners reads hackney borough counselors <laughs> Sophie Conway, Carol Williams, uh, Sadie Eddy attended the City Hall event and said they were challenged by security. We were quite stunned at the time, Ms. Conway said. Greater London Authority said it did not tolerate discrimination, of course, and was investigating the matter. A spokesman said the Greater London Authority took complaints of this nature extremely seriously and would take action if it was found to be appropriate. The event was held on the 10th of March, two days after International Women's Day, which celebrates how far women have come in society and aims to raise awareness of sources of inequality. It was organized partly as a networking event and was attended by businesswomen, campaigners, charity workers, and women from a range of backgrounds. Ms. Conway, labor counselor for Hackney Central, said when we arrived at City Hall, we were met by two security guards who asked us what we were there for. When we explained what event we were there to attend, we were asked if we were there to clean it. We were quite stunned at the time, so we sort of stood there in disbelief. 
Ms. Williams, labor counselor for ha uh, Hoxton West, who is also part-time doctoral researcher, said there was an instant recognition on his face as soon as the words came out of his mouth so he knew what he had said was inappropriate but by that point it was too late to take it back it goes on a little bit more i'll post the report uh, on our facebook page but she wanted to share that and she included in her email that this should be included in workplace racism uh which i agree with but she said she wanted to share it on this program uh i'll go to uh june allen had you heard about this event and if not any any thoughts uh, from what you heard in the report no this is the first time i'm hearing it but it's just oh dear it's, it's just ridiculous you know um yeah and i just think it, you know it is important to reiterate again you know in in england you know i know that i was speaking to somebody about it today actually you know people tend to think you know like in the uk that somehow the racism over here is a bit more sanitized and you know, but we, we experience it. It's just it's just more it's more subtle. You know, it's more subtle, and and this is an example of that. You know, it's absolutely outrageous that that, that these things are still happening. But I'm, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. You know, because there are there are still. I think the population of, of us here. I think it's four percent or something like that in the UK. I don't quote me on that. But so yeah, it, it doesn't surprise me that people still think that. You know, whenever there's a black person around, that somehow, you know, we have to be in 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 a lower some sort of a lower position, or you know, we're not good enough to be in in um, you know doing something uh, constructive. Um, yeah, I'm 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 not. You know, it's still it's still it's hard to hear these things, but I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. You know, um, and I you know I hope that these these women that were involved in this incident. You know they do. They, they they take it as far as they can in order to get this this um, rectified. And well done to them for speaking out because it's just absolutely just absolutely disgrace. You know. So yeah, that's kind of my take on it. Not surprised at all. Not surprised. Absolutely. Uh, even though uh, African eighteen eighty four, you are not in England. Uh, joining us from Austria. Any any thoughts you want to add to that report? Um, all I gotta say is that. Um we should try and not be so surprised about uh, such events or experiences, you know, and just uh, hope for the best, but expect the worst. That's what I'd say. Amen. I'm an advocate of that way of thinking. I heard Mr. And this is like years ago. The cows wasn't even on the air at the time. Uh, Mr. Fuller said, uh, do not expect correct treatment ever. Uh, as long as the system of white supremacy exists, that's just the mind frame that you have to have. And uh, when he, he, as I said, the cows wasn't on. So he was on somebody else's broadcast saying this. And uh, the, the listeners or the folks participating were stunned. Were like, what? that is crazy and you know who is this old coot why did you have him on the program talking you know nonsense like this and he said you know that's that's a terrible way to think i know but this is all day every day and someone presented an event very similar to what you just heard even though it was not happening in england but a black person being treated discourteously and even thrown out of a building and he said this this happens all day every day in fact i'm reminded there was an event very recently where a group of black females in the states they were uh i think they were at either a hotel or some sort of business establishment it might have been a restaurant but they came and it was a group of them and the establishment some suspected racist at the establishment he assumed that they were prostitutes uh and went to challenge them i think he went and got you know nasty with them like hey you know uh, i see you i know what you're doing uh don't be trying to you know pull anything in here if you do i'm gonna call the police we'll let you stay for the time you know just talk like no questions asked no nothing just you know you're 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 prostitutes that's what you are and you know i got my eye on you and they they did the same thing they had black self-respect uh to post about this they commented about this but uh, exactly what uh, African 1884 just said. I think understanding racism, and white supremacy, so that we're not surprised about these events and then have the black self-respect that uh, these council women displayed uh, to speak out about the event. I think they posted it on social media to get a lot of uh, attention. Not that they're going to fire this, you know, suspected racist security guard, but at least to get it out there so that more people are informed, aware of how big of a problem this is. Even when you dread, they got photographs. All of these folks look professional. 
beautiful, well dressed. Even under those circumstances, you're just another nigger, might be a prostitute. Moving forward, um, uh, and I see some of the folks who, who dialed in. I'll try and sprinkle in calls as we go. Just give me a, a few moments. Um, I'll go ahead and do it now, even though uh, if other folks, as they are joining, if they're coming in late, uh, I might go back and get their perspective on the issue as well, just because a lot of people were talking about it. The big uh, brouhaha between Samuel L. Jackson, black male uh, actor, uh, where he said that uh, British actors, actresses were uh, taking black people's jobs. Importantly, he did clarify in the statement that he was not knocking the black British actors, actresses per se. He was laying blame with the system. That's what he said. Put that in quotes. Uh, I take that to be the system of white supremacy. White people. Um, but this caused a big kerfuffle. They've had lots of articles. Uh, the online uh, magazine uh, in the UK, they were writing about this uh, incident. They had a lot of different articles on it also. Um, did you all see this? Uh, not Again, not that it's the most important thing happening within the system of racism, white supremacy, but I did want to make sure we had a comment on it. Uh, let's see, I'll, I'll just go with June, uh, since Miss Allen, she's our representative from uh, England right now. Did you hear about all of this? Any thoughts about this episode? I, I did. I, I thought it was a bit sad, actually, because it just it just kind of reminded me of, you know, this kind of divide and conquer, this kind of let's get them all squabbling amongst themselves, let's get black people squabbling amongst themselves to avoid, you know, some of the bigger issues. And... You know, I understand what he's saying to a certain degree because he's, you know, what he's saying is, you know, the experience would have been different if it had been, you know, if it had been a black American actor. But it's just like saying, well, you know, we're all under the system of white supremacy. You know, our experience of racism in in the UK is 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 um it's not it's not worse or easier or you know his is not more violent than us. You know, we all we all live under the system of racism, so it's like. For him to try and sort of compare that is just, yeah, I, I just thought it was a bit, I thought it was a bit ridiculous, to be honest. You know, I've heard, I've heard a few, um, you know, American actors that, that play Jamaican, you know, and the accents are terrible, you know, if he wants to go there with that, you know, sort of thing, but... You know, at the end of the day, that you know, whoever's doing the film, they 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 budget and they do whatever they have to do. I mean, you know, he's Samuel L. Jackson was saying that the, you know the cheaper actors were probably cheaper and stuff like that, which was which was a cheap shot. I just think you know this sort of comes under the kind of infighting, you know, and you know as as Dr. Welsing and 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 brother Neely Fuller would say, you know, that kind of in-house bickering just you know, it feeds, it feeds the system, it feeds the system, you know, just, just to high five the actors that have got the job, high five them that have got the job, as long as it's, you know, the work is constructive and, and all of those things, why not, why shouldn't they have it, you know, at the end of the day, we, you know, we're all trying to, to earn a living and, and, you know, the, the brother, I haven't seen the, I haven't seen the film Get Out, um, but, you know, I hear it's a great film and, you know, and that's it, you know, I don't, yeah, I just think it's, he wasn't saying that the, the guy's a bad actor or anything, he was just saying, from what I understand from the article, he was saying that, you know, the experience of, 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 the, of an actor in the US would have been different, so why is he even saying it? If the brother was a bad actor or something, I'd understand it, but, you know, I just thought it was a bit petty, to be honest, you know, and he needs to be high-fiving the brother and not, not kind of... Um, yeah, not not kind of stirring up, stirring that up because it's to me it's just kind of it smacks of the whole, you know, similar sort of dynamic to the whole colorism thing. It's kind of you know, yeah. Anyway, that's that's kind of my 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 take on it. You know, high five the brother. That's it. <laughs> hmm. Fascinating, fascinating. I, uh, I when he said that, I heard him say that uh, some of the I guess actors that come, whether they're from Britain or wherever they're from, uh, that they uh, might be cheaper. I was curious, one, is that true? Uh, and then why would that be the case um, in terms of uh, white people are in charge? It's not Samuel L. Jackson that's setting, you know, the wage scale for what people are going to make, what black people, wherever they were born at, are going to make. So is that true? One. And if it is, why would that be the case that black people from Britain, you can pay them less than black people from someplace else? I was curious about that as well. Um, 
African 1884? Did you did you hear about all this? Any any thoughts on this? Uh, yes, I did. Um, I mean, I'll start off by saying uh, VGQ, Victims Guaranteed Qualification. So Samuel L. Jackson is a victim of racism and supremacy, and he said what he said. Otherwise, um, it just it just goes to show our understanding, especially his understanding of the system of racism and supremacy. Because just like what you said, I mean, I think the not I think, but I know that the people who are paying all non-white people in Hollywood or giving non-white people the opportunities to work in Hollywood are white people. They're the ones who create those spaces for all non-white people. Yeah. So it just shows us where a lot of our people, the understanding of race and supremacy is at. Other than that, I would like to say that I wish Samuel L. Jackson would stop hanging out with Quentin Tarantino. I don't like that racist white supremacist suspect. That's all I have to say. Oh, I think they are doing a, another movie. I mean, they've done quite a, a few of them uh, already, uh, all the way back to uh, the Pulp Fiction days and Hateful Eight and Django Unchained. But I think they are working on uh, another project as well. That that probably would be constructive. Uh, ditch, uh, he certainly has VGQ, but Ditch, uh, Quentin Tarantino. Great start. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, one one thing I will say, and like I said, I want to make sure it's uh, a proportionate amount of time. If any of our other UK listeners uh, do join in, uh, I will get their thoughts on this because so much time and energy was invested in this topic over the past I don't know, 10 days or so since it happened. Um, I find it interesting with all of the things that are happening, have happened on the planet uh, since the beginning of the year, how much attention this got, uh, him making this comment. And this is not new. Like people have been uh, raising this point uh, for years now. I think uh, going all the way back, I mean, like mainstream, not, you know, some small outlet or what have you. Mainstream people have been ma- uh, making this point since Selma came out uh, at the end of 2014 uh, when they had non-American uh, black actors playing uh, Dr. King and Coretta Scott King in that film. Uh, and there was a big dialogue. Even some white people got uh, involved in that about, you know, is what do we think about this? And, you know, why is this being done? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, this getting that much attention, uh, I'm just of the opinion that there are things that are of much greater uh, importance uh, to black people worldwide than, you know, the movie Get Out and did they get a black person who was born here or a black person who was born in Jamaica or wherever else to be in this role or whatever role. I just, I have said consistently, I said it yesterday, I'll say it again. Uh, it would be great if black people just took the position, we don't even do movies. Like, I don't care if my mom is going to be in the role. I'm um, like, I don't do movies. I'm not spending a quarter, a nickel uh, to go see your film. And if you want to look at it from an economics perspective uh, that Mr. Fuller lays out with time and energy, I'm not going to finance your film. And I'm not going to give you my time and energy. Uh, where this is 90 minutes that I could be doing anything. I could be working on a podcast. I could be reading Dr. Wells's, Dr. Welsing's The ISIS Papers. Uh, I could be writing a review. I could be doing lots of things as opposed to sitting in your theater uh, and, you know, scarfing down some popcorn to watch whatever you want to put on the big screen. I think that would be a much uh, more constructive investment of our time and energy and show uh, having our priorities uh, in a better position. I could be in error. Context of white supremacy, global Sunday talk on racism. Uh, one more thing before I get to, to some of the folks who called in, if they have questions or even if they want to share uh, some of the topics that we've discussed so far. Um, pulling my notes back. The elections that have been taking place, I know they just had the election in the Netherlands. Uh, Geert Wilders, this was a white guy who was uh, regularly compared to Donald Trump in the Netherlands, and he was kind of saying a lot of the same rhetoric. You know, he didn't want immigrants there, non white people, Muslims this, a lot of the same rhetoric. Uh, he did not win. Uh, they had the general election uh, in the Netherlands. His party didn't win. Uh, they were saying that, you know, this might represent uh, the far right, as they call it, uh, not being as successful uh, after 
Brexit and Donald Trump. Uh, Marine Le Pen, I think she's still one of the front runners for the French election uh, that's coming up. I think Germany, they're having their uh, election this year as well, uh, where it's the same type of sentiment. They're really upset about all the non-white immigrants uh, that Prime Minister Angela Merkel uh, has allowed to come into Germany. Have you all been following uh, these elections? What happened in the Netherlands? What's going on in France? And any commentary uh, as it relates to white supremacy? Uh, I guess I'll start with Africa in 1884. Yeah, I was I was um, following the elections in the Netherlands and um, here on this side of the world, Austria. A lot of people were. I mean, there's also push towards the right, quote unquote, right wing parties and all that. So uh, some folks were reporting on TV. They had an interview on the streets, and some of the white folks here were kind of like disappointed that the man did not win or did not get the majority vote and everything, you know. And there's some also who the quote unquote good meaning white folks who were excited about him not winning. Yeah. That was all that was that, that I got from this side of the world. Interesting. Wow. Uh June Allen again, she's uh in England. Uh did you was there much commentary in your part of the world about all these elections? Uh, any views on how this relates to white supremacy? Um, to be honest, I didn't really, you know, I didn't really read up that much about it. Um, but just, you know, the little that I did see, you know, all the stuff about immigration and all of that. You know, it's just, I'm just learning more and more that, you know, a friend of mine calls it the white supremacy shuffle. <laughs> he doesn't call it politics. He calls it the white supremacy shuffle. So, you know, that, that's basically what it is. You know, there's nothing, there's not going to be anything new in there that we don't know already. It's just, you know, joining the dots between what we're learning as we understand racism as it evolves and how it's playing itself out with these, with, with be it in the States or in Europe. You know, at the end of the day, if it's, if it's, you know, if it's white people, people who classify themselves as white, the agenda is always going to be dominated by what do we do about the fact that we're going to become, you know, that we could become extinct. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of, yeah, that that's that's the premise. And, yeah, it, the, 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 there's always news about the immigrant thing. But, you know, it's always in the U, it's here and, yeah. It's the, sa- it's the same story. It's the same story, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I should probably, you know, read a lot more of it than I do. But sometimes it's, it's yeah, it's, 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 it's hard. It's hard to kind of just to watch it play itself out in such a in such an ugly way, but um, but there you have it. Yeah, that's 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 the truth of where we are, and it, and it's important to you know to be a little bit aware, I suppose, of, of all that stuff. But yeah, that's kind of where I am with it. It certainly is repetitive. I will uh, agree with you wholeheartedly. There, repetitive, regardless of which part of the world you are analyzing uh, a lot of it will look very very similar uh, in terms of the white supremacy rhetoric white supremacy think um let me see uh some of the people that dialed in i think thomas in new york did you have a question comment that you wanted to get on on what's been discussed so far or if you had something else you want to add to the dialogue uh, you should be with us as well thomas in new york good evening can i be heard yes sir should i say good afternoon um I just um yeah, I, I wanted to chime in. I had a question, but um very briefly. I, I agree with um Mr. Jackson. I believe that um you know in, in the system it, it's it's terrible that they have to go and get black people from outside of America to play black people from America. And uh, I find it, you know, pretty appalling. And I wish that they would stop the the influx of the black British actors. And um, more than anything, the Canadian rappers, I just wish they would cut all that out. Um, but my question is, is um, to, the, to the foreign and to the, the European um, guests, how is um, North Korea portrayed in the media in North Korea, I mean, in, um, in your respective countries? Um, how are they portrayed by the white people? Could I, could I go first? Sure thing. Yeah. I mean, in regard to, I think the question is in regard to how is North Korea perceived here by white people? Is that the question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, 
for the most part, what I what I understand, what I see is that North Korea or the leader of North Korea is more or less when 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 they depict him or portray him in the media here, they portray him in a way where they try to make a mockery out of him, like he's just like like. Like just someone that they could they could poke fun at and everything that is not serious about what he's trying to do. They don't take his his uh, his let's say what he's been doing with the maybe trying to uh, shoot missiles here and there. They don't take that seriously here from in Austria to be precise, you know. But I think in the U.S. it's a very different reality when they think about North Korea. But in Austria, it's more or less the people are like this guy is a joke, you know. They don't really take him that serious. Interesting. Uh, June Allen in England, uh, do you want to respond to the same question about the perception of North Korea in your part of the world? Yeah, I, I just, yeah, I, I don't really, I have no idea. I've not really noticed it. I've not really um, been paying att- that much attention to it, to be honest. So I can't, I don't really have a response for it. I can't really comment honestly on it, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> more of Thomas in New York's uh, Drake bashing. I think he is a secret fan. Did you have another question, or did they answer your question? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I'm not a secret fan. I like my rappers who write their own songs. Um, I, my question, uh, my, my reason why I asked is because, uh, and I'm glad that the guy I think he's from Holland responded, because prior to this administration, it was always like he's a joke. But it seems like uh, right now they're taking him very seriously. I just want to know if that that was a change, you know, uh, worldwide. But uh, I guess they're still making him a joke over there. I mean, on. Hmm. That is interesting. Um, I'd be curious to see yeah, what the perception is in predominantly uh, white areas, like what they think about, you know, Kim Jong Un uh, and North Korea and their missile tests and what have you in like Germany. Uh, or France, you know, if they think this is a serious threat, we need to be paying attention and, you know, ready to respond with aggression, uh, or if they just think these are, you know, some clown non-white people who are no threat. Um, Yet with, I guess with Korea, also in South Korea, uh, they have had a lot of controversy of late. I don't know if folks have paid attention or any thoughts on how this factors into racism, white supremacy, but the president was just impeached and then they had a a high ranking official at Samsung, which is, you know, one of the biggest uh, companies over there uh, in that part of the world, making lots of money, mostly for whites, but, you know, non-white people in that area of the world have benefited as well. Uh, But the uh, this really high executive, he's about to take over the company. Uh, I think it's one of his family members is really old and is about to step down. So he'd be the one inheriting this conglomerate. And he just got indicted uh, saying he was, you know, engaged in all this corrupt behavior and trying to influence the current uh, administration, uh, political administration. Uh, and then the president just got uh, impeached, just like total uh, upheaval in this part of the world, which is, you know, overwhelmingly non-white people. Uh, I don't know if folks have been paying attention or thought anything was suspicious about all of this activity happening uh, in South Korea. No, I haven't. To bring me back to that book we read, um, what was that, Matthew Stoddard, I think, Stoddard? Um, Lothrop Stoddard, yeah, Lothrop Stoddard. Was, yes, uh, in 1919, they were very focused on this region. And um, implementing things to keep uh, keep them in power in that region, and um, I think that we're seeing a lot of that stuff playing out now. Absolutely, uh, that's in the, that whole region. Uh, I would say just might be interesting to take a look. They just on 60 Minutes. Some of the times uh, I watch new, particularly major news outlets like that just to see what they are focusing your attention on, uh, what they are saying is important. They just did a, a huge segment. They did one huge segment on uh, Marine Le Pen and the French elections and the perception of uh, she and her party as racist. Uh, and why they've taken the stance that they have, what what she hopes to do. It almost sounded like she was saying, make America, I mean, excuse me, make France great again, uh, could have been her slogan. That's why I say I would bet the farm, uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, to take the, the French election. Uh, but they had that. That was one big story on 60 Minutes. And then uh, within the same, I think, like week, they had like a big 
10, 15 minute story on North Korea, really all of North and South Korea. And they went to North Korea and it was all ominous, like, oh my gosh, these folks are dangerous and threatening and oh my god they even in fact they had a black male he was the reporter that you were seeing and was doing all the talking interviewing everybody and then they went to one of the u.s military bases in south korea uh where they were you know in their all this technology and monitors and spying on everything all their communications so they go talk to this major who is allegedly in charge and he's black too so you have these two black people talking about how yeah you know they act, you know, if they act up or do anything aggressive, we're going to wipe them off the map. I thought it was uh, some racial showcasing to have black people out doing this reporting. Uh, number one, I think that also deflected from this people seeing this and thinking racism, white supremacy to see white people talking about wiping uh, a quote unquote country of predominantly non-white people, wiping them off the planet. I thought some people might look at that if it was whites, a white reporter and a white general talking about this might say, hey, this sounds like what they call neocolonialism, white supremacy. So I thought that was strategic, too. And it just seemed to me, it seemed very propaganda, uh, much like propaganda uh, to get people to think these are villains. We got to take this seriously. These folks are are danger. These folks are a threat. I think they even went. Uh, if you if you're familiar with North Korea and South Korea, Mr. Fuller, Korean War veteran, uh, when you get to the border, they have uh, a room, I guess, where they can come and have meetings between the two. They've had hostilities. I guess they said in this piece that the war was never officially ended uh, between these two sections. So uh, you go there and they say, okay, once you go over this line, if you leave this area, you are officially in North Korea. And the black guy was all like, ooh. That's frightening. Let's get back over on on this side. It was it was about 15 minutes of just total propaganda, racism, white supremacy to paint these non-white people as total demons. I think white people are great. They are excellent at this sort of uh, whether it's we want to make O.J. Simpson seem like the worst person in the history of the universe or uh, it could be anybody, um, any non-white person in the world uh, that we want to you know just show them and have them looking uh, horrendous. We can make Nelson Mandela a terrorist uh, if we uh, want to. Robert Mugabe, we can make him look like a terrorist if we want to. We can spend 20 minutes and, and do it up. Uh, they are excellent at this sort of thing. Uh, I'll stop there. Any Anything to interject or folks, if, if you all want to move on to a different topic, that's fine. Uh, I just want to add something in regard to North Korea just one more time, yeah? Mm -hmm. I think I think the way um, the racist white supremacists operate in regard to what you call nation states. Uh, a country like Austria or Switzerland, they don't really take so much interest in regard to such spaces like North Korea, but they would let the other white supremacists, let's say in America, Germany, France, or England, deal with that. You know, that's why I guess from where I am here in Austria, it's a pretty small country, Central Europe. They don't really like, they, they, they just look at it as just fun and games when it comes to North Korea, you know. But I'm sure they, 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 they communicate with, uh, let's say, the white supremacists in the US or in the UK and everything. And they're the ones who are able to, you know, go up front and maybe just uh, continue spreading this clear propaganda that something wrong is happening or North Korea is doing something really wrong that could damage their quote unquote or uh, deplete or get rid of the white race, you know. But they don't really like, for example, like I said, for Austria, the, when the media is just, it just comes off like a mockery, like this guy is just, is just fun and games, you know. Hmm. Sometimes they'll add uh, a bit of both uh, where they do this person as a threat and then they'll still do some mockery. But I think that's important, too, um, where uh, I guess within the system of white supremacy, like other uh, white uh, nation states, quote unquote, they might allow more powerful ones. You deal with that. That's your issue. And we'll root uh, if we need to do any support, we can do that. But you all handle that. You all got it. We'll let the more powerful whites uh, take care of that issue. Uh, and I, I think I have seen that sort of thing uh, before. I think some of that even have, may have happened uh, with the Iraq conflict uh, back the, the one after 9-11. Uh, I think some of that might have happened in terms of who does the heavy lifting to go do this. And then the other uh, white nation states kind of sit back and cheerlead or whatever support role that they're going to play, if that makes sense uh, to folks. Uh, context of white supremacy, again, our global Sunday talk on racism. And again, this is not our normal program. This is not three hours. So if you have 
uh, questions, uh, if you have uh, a topic uh, that you'd like to hear an international perspective, since we have folks that are outside the states to kind of hear their views, uh, feel free, chime in. Just do not wait till the last second today because uh, this is a shorter broadcast. Uh, you can feel free. I have another question. Yes, sir. Um, I just want to know if the international, um, you know, black people if in those in respective countries, are they being um, influenced to donate their organs or to donate blood by these um, white countries? What was the question again? Sorry. Uh, well, are, are, are your countries um, in Europe influencing you guys to, to become organ donors or to um, donate blood? Okay, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, here in Austria, it's usually like this. Um, when you go donate blood, as a black person, they'll try and find out first where you come from in this regard. They'll, they'll say originally. I mean, if you were born, if you're a black person that's been born in Austria, they will handle your blood differently than a black person that's born on the African continent. Let's say you're a migrant, came from Africa, and you've been living in Austria for the last three years. You want to donate blood? your blood will be thoroughly screened compared to a black person that's been born here because they have all this quote-unquote propaganda in regard to HIV, AIDS, Ebola, you know, where you've, I mean, how long have you lived on the African continent and how long have you been living in the quote-unquote diaspora, you know? So they tend to, they don't really encourage black people to donate blood because if you do, for the most part, there have been cases where black people have tried to donate blood just or, or plasma, they've been rejected. They've been told, no, we don't want your blood and everything, you know? And that's because the, the, the case where they, they don't know what to do with the blood or they have fear of, 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 say, diseases, you know? So they tend to, just to repeat myself, when, if you come from the continent of Africa, they'll treat your blood differently as, as a black person who's been born and raised in Austria or in Europe. Huh. How about that? Uh, June Allen, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, no, it's in, it's interesting. Um, yeah, the, 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 yeah, I, I've had similar experience where you know there's the, uh, when I've given blood, um, they ask you know if you've been to Africa and you know they want to find out like if I was born here and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, I've I've had similar experience um, as well with that. So I just think it's it's interesting kind of getting it in context to to white supremacy and what that kind of means because like this was a long time ago I did this so I didn't really think anything of it but now just hearing the previous um, guy talking about it it's all coming back and it makes complete sense um, so I can see how that's kind of been brought in um, to the conversation um, but I don't know if I don't know if my blood was ever used or anything but um, yeah the questioning and stuff like that I, I 100% remember and that's that's exactly yeah that's how it goes they want to know where and if you if you've been away how long and all that kind of stuff so yeah it's, it's very it's real um it's very real they do i mean in terms of like organ donation and stuff like that it's not like advertised loads but you know they they encourage people to have like donor cards where you you kind of register that if you know if you die suddenly or whatever then you know you can get you can your organs will go to somebody else um if you if you pass away um but i just i remember hearing stories in the states where they're actually targeting people that sign up for these things for organ harvesting or something like that that's i don't know is that true that's kind of what i'm that's what i remember reading something in the states so i, I mean i'm not signed up to it and i've been reluctant to do it obviously because of now what i understand how i understand it from a from a white supremacy point of view um but yeah it's 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 quite scary actually that yeah we have to be so careful because you you go to the doctor you do these things thinking that it's for a good cause um but obviously because of the deception around white supremacy and how they've operated over the last you know few hundred years or whatever you know it's important to remember that it's always a lot bigger than that it's always a lot bigger than you know the question that they ask you or the reason that what you think they're asking you there's always something else behind it so yeah, that's the, the importance of understanding the layers to this that come with it. It's never anything simple. There's always layers beneath it that's important to um, to recognise. But yeah, so um, 
Yeah, it's a good question. So, yeah, thanks, thanks for asking. Absolutely. Racists always have a hidden racist agenda. Might not even uh, come to light uh, for years the other motivations that they had for doing or saying something. Uh, the caller at uh, 3246, did you have a question uh, for Miss June Allen, uh, African1884? You should be with us as well. Uh, 3246. Yes, sir. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Greetings to you, the host callers and the listeners. And greetings to the out of country um, or out of the U.S., uh, the black people out of the U.S. that are speaking. So I, I had a question about if um, if you hear a lot of conversation about um, about, OK, white people talking about their extinction, I, I've seen a lot of things on YouTube where they talk about migrants coming into Europe and that that will lead to their extinction. And it looks like a lot of these these conversations are like public conversations. I'm just wondering, are you all are, have you do you know are black people are part of those public conversations at all? Uh, for me personally, it's June here. Um, for me personally, I've never heard white people, you know, white people don't say it to me directly. Um, but like yourself, I've I've um, I've witnessed these conversations on on social media, on YouTube, um, just various internet websites. I've seen them, you know, uh, white supremacists having these conversations. I've you know I've, I've downloaded a few memes from these from these uh, uh, websites. There was one particular um, conversation that I was reading and it was about, I think it was about, um, what's his name, Tom Hanks. Um, one of his, his, his grandchildren, I think, is is, um, is mixed. And yeah, there, there, there was loads of people on the thread, you know, saying that he's let the side down and how the grandchild is a monkey and you know, no racial mixing because, you know, we, there's only 8% of us left on the planet. And they were literally saying all the things that Dr. Welsing was talking about, about fear of genetic annihilation and all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, this thread kind of went on for ages and they were just talking about no, no race mixing. And there is a genuine fear, you know, with these people that, they are going to not be on the planet for much longer because it's declining. You know, they're, they're, they're not having babies when they're supposed to be, you know, the, the death rate is, is higher than, so they're dying off a lot quicker than they're having babies. So, you know, the birth rate is minus or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I've not heard, you know, white people have never said it to me directly, but it's stuff that I've, you know, I've read, I've read online a lot of it. So, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, it's a genuine, it's a genuine fear for them, as as we know, and they're they're being a lot more bold about it. And even um, what was it? There was that recent um, video that I seen. I forgot the guy's name, Jared. Jared oh, and Taylor. he was talking to the Mexican guy. That's it, Jared Taylor with the Mexican guy, and he blatantly talks about it. What's going to happen to me? Well, you know, we're a minority. It's okay for you. And he was playing the victim. He's a, he's a white supremacist. He's a victim. He, he was playing the victim. What's going to happen to me and my people? That's what the sort of things that he was saying. So it's becoming more, you know. What's up, Lil I'm in there. So? Oh, uh, I think we're picking up. Oh, I don't know. Maybe somebody was unmuted. Hmm. Maybe somebody was yeah. unmuted. How? Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so uh... basically. <coughs> I'm oh, sorry. just added someone. One of our uh, callers was finally able to join us. Uh, we'll get him in a second, though. Sorry for the interruption, uh, Miss Allen. It's okay. It's cool. Yeah. So just just saying that. Yeah. It's you know it, it's becoming a lot more um, white people are becoming a lot more vocal about you know their situation. Um, yeah, it's absolutely fascinating that Dr. Wilson was able to predict this and and write all of this stuff when she did because. You know, it seems you know, absurd at the time. You know, back in back in the day, but it's all coming out now, and white people are saying it. They're talking openly about it, about their fear of it. So yeah, it's all the more reason for you know for black people to be aware of of this, um, and so we can adapt 
our behavior once we start understanding racism from that perspective then you know it becomes easier for us to understand the behavior and therefore and therefore change our own behavior to set the boundaries around around that so we can protect ourselves you know so yeah that's that's my take on it uh african 1884 did you want to respond to the same question yes um from, from my position um being in austria i try very much as possible not to engage in such conversation with white people especially on the job because i've had the experience where i've said certain things on the job and uh, ended up losing the job because white folks would want to pick your mind this before i said uh being in contact with mr fuller or listening to or reading uh uh, the Cress, uh, the book by Miss Cress Welsing and everything. I, I, I used to tend to just speak my mind to white folks and everything, but now I'm trying to learn how to just sit back and listen and ask them questions. But other than that, also on the job, I try to avoid going in this direction to get their opinion in regard to if they're fearful about uh, white genetic annihilation or anything like that. I tend to just uh, try and speak about what I'm doing on the job what my duties are, and then I do my eight hours and I move on. Other than that, Saturdays and Sundays, I don't spend time with white folks. I surround myself with black people where I can easily try and uh, maintain and uh, improve the code and just speak about constructive things. Hey, man. Hey, man. Awesome. Awesome. Um, that, too, could be in workplace racism, and I am a big-time advocate of, of that uh, method of codification uh, where I'm not on the job to share my views on racism or get in big debates. I just listen to what they're talking about. Maybe I ask a question. Maybe I just observe and listen. And uh, yeah, I'm a big advocate of that because I've seen the same thing here in the States and elsewhere in the world. We've had commentary to evidence uh, starting to talk about your views, particularly if you want to speak honestly about white supremacy, you can end up being unemployed quickly. Uh, caller at uh, 3246, did that answer your question, sir? Yes, thank you. For sure, for sure. Uh, Frank Fanon, are you with us as well? Yes, I'm here. Sorry for coming in late. Sorry. No apologies. Glad to have you with us as well, sir. Also uh, joining us from England. Um, we covered... Uh, we covered so much. Did anything uh, stand out that you just wanted to make sure that you uh, shared with listeners related to white supremacy? Um, I, I, I went out last night to see Get Out. And um, yeah, that's been, that's been um, on my mind uh, a bit. But uh, apart, I mean, I didn't really learn anything new from it, but I, I did get a lot of things about white supremacy validated um, from watching the, the film, um, but yeah, that's that's about it, really. The international sensation, Get Out! Wow. <laughs> uh, what? Uh, I guess you said you didn't learn anything from the film. You just had a lot of things that you already knew uh, confirmed. Uh, I guess what was the the major theme that you took from uh, the film that was confirmed? Um, I would say that. The, the major theme was the, the very important role of white women in, in the maintenance of, of white supremacy. So um, I don't want to give out any spoilers or anything, but like the, the role that the, that the mother of the girl had in being able to keep everyone in line and keep, keep the whole operation, this, this operation of... Um, feasting on black flesh going was uh, uh, her role was quite influential like they, they showed the man um who who basically he's basically the, the a typical white man who goes around the world conquering um the natives and bringing bringing some trophies and and war booty and stuff but she uh, her place was in the home and and her place being in the home was quite instrumental in in being able she, she was able to hypnotize the, the people and um yeah it was just really i felt like her role was more important than his role because his role was was more about conquering the bodies of people but her role was was, was about conquering the minds and even there was a suggestion that if his own mind was conquered by 
her as well because she hypnotized him to stop him from smoking. So um, yeah, white women are dangerous. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's the, yeah that was what that was something that got validated yesterday. And um, yeah, that I, I think that was the most important thing there. Fascinating, fascinating. Did you have a, a quick comment on the uh, conflict that was generated by uh, Samuel L. Jackson saying that uh, he thought it was incorrect to have uh, black Brits or black people that were born outside the states uh, playing roles where they're uh, pretending to be uh, African-Americans uh, and that whole kerfuffle? Did you have any uh, thoughts on that as it relates to white supremacy? Um, I, I, I think he's, he's a bit, he's a bit confused in the sense of, like, I don't know if the, if the filmmaker, Jordan Peele, did this on purpose, but, like, um, having a black British person being the main actor actually helped, well, helps to allow black folks to realize that racism and white supremacy is not just a, an American-centric problem, you know, it's a global issue. And, and whether you're black in the U.S. or whether you're black in Africa or whether you're black in Europe, you know, it affects us. Maybe it, it, it manifests differently, but, you know, it's, it's, it's there. It's, it's all around us. It's global, you know. So I, I, I feel like um, Samuel L. Jackson's views were a bit... I think he's confused. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a lot. I don't, I, don't wanna, I don't really want to play into him too, too much. Because um, I, I think he, he didn't think before he opened his mouth um, <laughs> to, to make those comments. But, yeah. Context of white supremacy. Uh, all of us still learning. Uh, I would encourage folks, uh, catch the free version. If you do have to see uh, Get Out, uh, I don't think Jordan Peele is going to be the person that gets the most coins, nickels, pounds, francs uh, from this film. Uh, I suspect it'll be uh, yeah. racists who uh, make the most money. So if you got to see it, you want to see it for counter-racist study purposes, uh, I am sure, because I saw it and I didn't have to pay for it. So I am sure uh, you will be able to easily get your hands on yeah, a pretty good copy agree. Uh, by now to take notes. You can Sorry. watch it as many times as you need. Gus? Sorry. Yes, was it? Uh, yes, sir. Sorry, I yeah, when did you watch it? Sorry to to ask. Yeah, when you get, do you have a link for you? When did you watch it? Uh, a listener sent me the file, uh, so I did not have a link. I just downloaded it um, and moved. So you could have that copy, I guess. I could uh, just send you that copy, but I think now there is uh, a link uh, online where you could see the film for free. So. I guess you you have options. You have multiple free options, and you'll probably have more free options as the seconds tick by. I'm sure someone is uploading a even better copy right now. But yeah, I can either send you the file I have or send you a link. I'll have to look again to see if there are better better versions than the one that I have. Okay, thank you. Appreciate. It. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, some of our other folks are calling. How uh, how grand? Let's see. I'll see if I can bring in any of them if they want to get commentary. I just want to make sure that I emphasize again with all of the the films and, and even forget films with all of the things that are happening in the world. Um, racists, they are phenomenal at getting us to focus our attention on things that they want us to focus on. Uh, and that's what I've said from the very beginning with this film. Uh, get out, uh, which raised my suspicions. Anything that white people are excited, and I've seen a lot of white people who are excited and talking about this film, uh, even if they are not with glee, right, and decked out in full get out uh, paraphernalia, t-shirts and hats and, you know, party favors and the whole night, even if they're not doing that, just the fact that that film is being talked about this much still. It's been out for two weeks and it's on the front page of the New York Times right now. <laughs> they got a whole interview about this and even this conflict with Samuel L. Jackson, that helps uh, get, get more controversy. White people are great uh, about that. We can get you to focus on this when we want you or we can get you to ignore this. Uh, I stated before, a black male was found hanging from a tree in Washington State where I am. That can get nearly as much attention as get out hanging from a tree in 2017, no less under suspicious circumstances. 
that didn't get nearly as much attention as Get Out. Just getting I've said that a few times before, but I do think that is important. Okay, they are uh, encouraging me to hurry. Let's see if I can add any of our other uh, UK folks uh, in the last 20 minutes or so before we uh, wrap up here. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, Andrew, are you with us, sir? Can you hear us? Oh, we were not able to get Andrew in. Dang, he was uh, he was calling. I'll try again. I don't know what's it's. There seems like there might be some tech issues keeping uh, us from getting uh, some of our UK listeners on. I think we had that problem last time with uh, Andrew specifically, where it was some sort of uh, issue getting his line open. Uh, while I'm trying to get that resolved, uh, did folks have other commentary that they wanted to get in? And again, to our listeners, if you have a, a question uh, you want to ask any of our, our listeners, you should do so now because uh, the clock is ticking. I don't know what that problem is. I'll assume nobody uh, had a question, comment that they uh, wanted to get in. Uh, I will remind folks as well, from the ceremony yesterday in honor of Dr. Welsing, uh, they had a lot, I am told, of uh, the different lectures that she's done from the Welsing Institute over the years. Uh, poet Danny Queen, he's been a guest on that program uh, before. He was with us last year after her transition. And he said then, hey, if you you know want to get some of the CDs of lectures that she did, uh, drop me an email. Uh, I've posted his contact information online. Uh, I can send you his email. Uh, I think he even puts his phone number online. I don't know how comfortable I am giving his phone number out, but I certainly can pass you his email if you want to get in touch with him and kind of go through the catalog and maybe pick out a Welsing Institute lecture or five uh, that you would like to order. Uh, I know me personally, I'm trying to get my hands on the one that she did, the first Welsing Institute lecture that she did after Hurricane Katrina. And then I would like to get the Welsing Institute lecture that she did after the passing of uh, Madiba, Nelson Mandela, back in 2013. I'm told that that was uh, fascinating for a number of reasons. <laughs> I think there was some name-calling directed at the deceased Madiba, and Dr. Welsing just put on a brilliant demonstration of black self-respect and just being truthful about racism, white supremacy. But poet Danny Queen, uh, if you want to get contact information to get some of the lectures that Dr. Welsing has done, Drop me a line and we'll hook you up. See, I'm going to try. I'm sorry, did I miss someone? Oh, maybe they were being those. I'm going to try again to see if I can get uh, Andrew with us because we missed him last time too. I don't know uh, why we're having so many difficulties uh, getting him with us on the line. Used to not be uh, that troublesome before, and it's still not going through. We will can continue. I June. Can I suggest something? Yes, ma'am. happened to me. Um, sometimes, because I know that Skype quite often do updates quite regularly. Sometimes if you get them to do the update and then come back on the line for you to add them, sometimes that, that will work. If he hasn't done regular updates, then sometimes it, they won't let them add you on. I see. I think we uh, okay. actually have him now. Andrew, are you with us, sir? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Hi, Gus. Greetings. Good to hear you, sir. Crazy. The tech issues. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, wow. I feel like we touched on so much. Uh, we were talking about North Korea, South Korea, and their perception in the world. I guess that we can start right there. That was a question Thomas in New York asked. Um, the other folks already responded, so this is you, uh, Andrew. Have you uh, noted how North Korea uh, or Kim Jong-un, how the country or their leader quote unquote, is uh, discussed in the UK, like how do white people talk about them? Do they perceive them as like a serious threat or are they talked about as more of a, a cartoonish joke? That was Thomas in New York's question. Yeah, it, well, it's um, f thanks for bringing me on, by the way. For, first of all, God, I really appreciate it. For sure. um, yeah, well, well it's, it's, it's funny because um, it, it seems to have changed um, uh, about a year ago, even up to about six months ago. He, he seems to have been treated as a bit of a joke, right? And, and his country full of repression. Um, but all of a sudden, in the last, uh, um, in the last, I don't know, in the last month, he seems to have, you know, white people seem to be talking about him uh, in a more serious manner. And the, and the words they're using is 
that he is a threat. Or, 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 you know, you know. So the, or, uh, there's a lot of words around uh, him being a threat. Um, so you know, I I always ask a threat to what? You, you know, this the question: a threat exactly to what? Um, and that and and you know, you know, that's it. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it, he seems to be, or he seems to represent for me, um, one of many threats to white supremacy. You know. That's the you know that that seems to be it to me, and uh, it's the whole thing about who is allowed to have guns. You know who's allowed to carry guns. You know who's allowed to have guns, and and that, and it seems to be from that point of view that he's spoken about. You know, so yes, white people seem to be uh, talking about him and using the word threat. He's a threat. So that's you know that's that's what I, that's what I've. Heard on the radio, you know, when it's all about the threat. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting noting the time change. Um, you said within the last six months or so, it went from him being a joke to him being a threat, even though they haven't identified who it is. It, some, it changed within the last six months or so. Oh, I didn't. Need, Andrew, uh, are you still with us, Andrew? Greetings, folks. I got disconnected uh, somehow there. I was, I think it was uh, after I added uh, Andrew to the line, I thought I had him there and everybody was connected. It was all good. And then realized that I had uh, got disconnected from the other line, which uh, is a total pain because uh, then I have to dial everybody back. I have been uh, unsuccessful in getting all of the technology necessary to uh, have it so that I don't have to add or call our national folks because it, uh, as the numbers have increased, it has uh, become challenging. And for some reason, I tend to get disconnected from the uh, program line uh, somehow, even if I remain connected to uh, our listeners uh, outside uh, the states, uh, I will get disconnected from the program line uh, somehow, some way, and it just uh, makes it uh, makes it difficult. Uh, I thought we were going to get through the whole program this time without having that uh, happen, and right at the end, it uh, right at the end got me. But uh, I'm dialing everybody back uh, presently. Uh, I hope people got uh, Andrew's response on North Korea because I thought that was uh, important and went right to Thomas's question. I was just trying to clarify to make sure that he did say it was within the last uh, six months that this. Uh, change happened in terms of Kim Jong Un uh, being seen more as a as a threat. Um, uh, so we have uh, Frank Fanon back. Uh, we have oh, I think we might yeah. have everybody back. Outstanding, uh, Andrew. I was just trying to make sure I heard correctly. You said it was the change happened with Kim Jong Un in the last six months in terms of it first him being kind of a joke and now it being oh, this is a serious threat. Did I hear that correctly? Exactly. Correct. Yeah. Right. And um, yeah, th that seems to be the long and the short of it, really. Um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, it seems to be uh, related to, to, to weapons, to who's got weapons and whether or not white countries feel that they should let this non-white person have weapons. Mm. You know? Wow. So that is very a uh, strong pattern worldwide uh even on a on a micro level about black people talking about self defense and we should have firearms or whatever it is to defend ourselves or on a macro level uh when you ha start having a predominantly non white what they call country uh and they're talking about nuclear defense uh, or increasing yeah. their defense to try as best they can to protect themselves uh, <clears throat> on a planet dominated by white supremacy you see the same response right. uh negras are not supposed to have guns or weapons yeah, um, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. right on um, no, yeah. No, I, was, I was just going to say that um, go ahead Andrew yeah, uh, uh, so, 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 sorry guys I was just going to say that, um, that, that that's exactly it and um, it, it seems to me that um, sorry but I think all non-white countries you see it's hard it's hard for them to police all non-white countries if all non-white countries uh, basically get try to get armed it's going to cause a lot of problems for white people you know and <laughs> and, and you know uh, eventually well that's the direct gun no, that, that's my personal view mm. Reminds me, I think uh, Minister Malcolm, this is 
1960s. Uh, he was talking, I just forget the exact year. This is like 1963, 1964. Uh, he was asked, like, what was, what, what did he think was the most important event of the year? And he said it was uh, China's development of their military capabilities. Uh, and he was talking about the reason being that they, this means that whites are not going to be able to be as reckless uh, in mistreating and abusing them. Uh, they'll have to be uh, more strategic uh, because these folks can do considerable damage uh, to whites now that they've upgraded their military uh, capabilities. Um, going to the same point uh, anytime if it's a quote unquote non-white nation uh, and they're saying, hey, we're going to take this seriously and we're going to try as best we can to defend ourselves. Oh, man, <laughs> whites do everything that they can to undermine that. And you're a boogie monster. You all are horrible to make everybody in the world uh, think that, you know, you're just the worst group of folks ever uh, while they have all of the weapons you can imagine. And then some still roll. That's I think Trump's budget. He's cutting everything except defense spending and <laughs> veteran expenses new budget that he came out with this week um i guess the other popular topic of the day before you uh joined in with us uh andrew was about um the movie get out and the whole kerfuffle uh with sam jackson's comments did you have a, a quick word on that before i get one of our callers questions So, so, sorry, Gus. Um, the line went a bit funny for a minute. Do I have a comment on who? The the whole uh, conflict with uh, the film Get Out, and then Samuel L. Jackson saying that he had a problem with British, uh, black British actors or actresses taking uh, African American uh, entertainers' roles and what have you. Did you, Did you have a comment about any of that? No, I, I've not heard about that. No, I'd like to. I'd like to know what was said. I I don't. I've not heard about that at all. Wow, I am amazed. <laughs> you might be no, the only. No, I've not, not heard about. I've not heard about it. That is amazing. I think you might be the only person on the line who has said that. I think you might be the only wow. person I've talked to in the last two weeks who has said, "Oh yeah, I didn't yeah. know anything about that." No, That's... no, no. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I, I must admit, I've been, I've been very busy. I've been very busy at work for the last three. Well, God knows how long, to be honest. Good. But um, but but no, I mean um, no. I'd, I'd like to know. I'd like to I'd like to know something about that. Oh, well, <laughs> I will not be the person to inform you <laughs> only because oh, okay. <laughs> only because it's not that high on my priority list. Uh, I'm sure mm. you can find out they have a, an article about it in uh, the online uh, for the UK. Mm. You can read it there. It's been big news, but it's it's uh, just conflict among non-white people where we're not really focused on the problem, in my opinion. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I'll be honest, though, Gus. Mm -hmm. I, I have heard. Um, in the last year, I have heard um, different uh, rumblings in that area uh, um, from um, from various um, um, African American. You know, you know, just just general, and um, uh, and, you know, it goes back to what Needy Fuller says. You know, um, well, it goes back to a few things. One, it's the whole thing about that's his paycheck. Where is mine? Right. So, so there is that. But, you know, on another level, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you have an African film industry in Africa. Um, and I, you know, I mean, uh, what, what one I'd love to see one day Africans in the Caribbean, Africans in Europe, Africans in America start to make links. I know they're doing it slowly, but start to make more links with the African film industry because it's massive. You know, and, and and as far as I'm concerned, then you won't have to go and ask white people for anything. You know, so so, so that's so, or, or or at least you know be less orientated towards Hollywood. And and for me, you know, that would be you know that's a that's a better frame of mind. You know, that, that's my just my general point of view. Here, here, black self-respect, and I just heard a report again. I already knew this, but they were just repeating uh, from some of the white supremacist uh, folks, uh, where they were reminding folks that by the end of the century, uh, the continent of Africa is projected to be forty percent of the world's population. So you certainly have a enormous movie-going audience on the continent that you could play to, and presumably that would be a lot of dark people. Uh, That's the, right. The person who dialed in with a hand up. Did you have a question uh, for any of our participants? Uh, you should be 
with us as well? I guess I can't really. Looks like you dialed in from a block number, perhaps. Did you have a question, or are you just listening? Let's see. Oh, okay. me. Uh, I reckon you should be with us. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, this is me, Mr. Fox. I'm just, um, I've dialed in through the way you suggested, but I've not been able to have any input whatsoever. Oh, well, we can hear you now. So <laughs> did you have input you wanted to share? Um, da, 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 da. regarding the, um, Samuel L. Jackson, well, conf- um, controversy, which, um, they'd like to blow it up as I agree with Andrew because um, African continent has got a very large um, especially with Nollywood as well I know that the um, acting um, level might be a lot different from what Samuel's used to but it is there and if you want to you know build up your own film industry you have to take the sacrifice and actually you know go and do this so I do think that wanting this white accolade all the time and wanting your props from Hollywood, which you're not going to get, if you want to start your own, I think Africa is the best place to go because it is, you know, it is up and coming. It's like um, it's like Bollywood. They don't make the greatest movies, but Indian people, you know, recognise that and they um, identify with it and it makes billions of not about billions but it makes a lot of money every single year they go and support their film so if we want the same i suggest he takes himself to um africa and actually you know starts being a pioneer in something over there absolutely i've been seeing where they're, they're doing a lot of the same things uh getting the streaming services uh having something that's the equivalent of netflix uh basically so they can do original content streaming and and the whole nine should be lots of opportunities uh in front of the camera and behind the camera uh for black filmmakers um since you you said you couldn't share did you have input on uh anything else that was discussed dr welsing's birthday the elections that took place in europe uh or the perception of uh north korea um i didn't catch majority of what the other stuff was um what was discussed but i caught the the north korea part and i agree with what you said regarding the um, non-white people and weapons and who is allowed to have nuclear weapons because the f- main part is now regarding nuclear weapons is white people. They've allowed India and Pakistan to get nuclear weapons, which I'm very surprised on. And I want to know how they've done it. I don't know if they purchased them from Russia, but um, yeah, regarding North Korea, yeah, they have, I think they have nuclear weapons at this moment in time. But how I see nuclear weapons, they are a deterrent from being invaded. And North Korea, even though it doesn't have a great ally and on a a very friendly basis with China, China doesn't want South Korea or any other white European country or superpower invading North Korea and being right on their um, doorstep. So North Korea does have um, an ally with nuclear weapons, China, back in um, North Korea. But regarding how they can be hurt economically with sanctions, that's how Europe and white supremacy are going to try and um, try and um, limit North Korea regarding their global influence. Because they might sell other weapons to certain groups that white supremacists don't want their hands getting on, especially. Hello. Hello. Uh, Hello? Yes, we can hear you. I don't know who that person is. Yes, we can hear you as well. Uh, is that no, um, Frank Fanon? I, it's, it's Frank. Yeah, it's me. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll let the gentleman finish his point, and then I wanted to make a point about North Korea as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right on. Sorry about that, Mr. Fox, if you want to finish your point, sir. Yeah. Kind of lost the train of thought there. <laughs> um... Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. 
Not a problem. Not a problem. I'm trying to remember now. Uh, I've lost it. India. I have to come back. I was trying to remember some of the last few. India and Pakistan, they've allowed them to have nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, China, they have their weapons because uh, Korea's right there. And if white people get uh, in conflict or something with uh, North Korea, then that's pretty close to where China is. So they want to make sure they have their defenses uh, in place as well. <laughs> it's pretty close to where yeah. they are. Yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty close to that. But regarding the nuclear weapons, um, obviously the West, well, white people, they they don't like non-white people having that, you know, that capability and having such a powerful weapon. And when you actually come to think about it, the actual battles which were done early in the um, 20th century with non-white people being either the communists and the West, basically the communists like Vietnam were always funded by other white people. So, it's, you know, white people squabbling amongst themselves using the lives of other non-white people. And after that, then certain countries, non-white countries, North Korea, India, Pakistan, they got nuclear weapons. But there are certain things you have to do when you have these nu nuclear weapons and there's certain agreements and things you have to abide by by other white people or they will hurt you economically. But a nuclear weapon is a deterrent from being invaded. I'll end with that. Hmm. Good point. Uh, Frank Fanon, you wanted to add, sir? Yes. Uh, so the point I wanted to add was that, um, I mean, in my 12 years of living in England and watching the news, um, I think the, the issue of North Korea is kind of similar to Iran. I, I think it kind of waxes and, and wanes. Like, they, they talk about them, them two countries where whenever they've made some kind of breakthrough in terms of like their, their capabilities, um, whether it's nuclear or just weaponry, they, they talk about them. And then after a while, it kind of goes down again. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah. So, so that was the point I wanted to make. Like, it's, it's not, I mean, for me, it's not, it's not been unlike what Mr. Andrew said for me, it's not, it's been, it's been, it's been something that's been ongoing and yeah from time to time they talk a lot about them they talk about them as a threat i mean recently with north korea as well and the the brother of the leader getting killed in thailand um it, i mean the north koreans have been in the news as well because of that but in terms of the the, the weaponry and the capacity to be able to defend themselves whenever they make a kind of breakthrough in terms of defending themselves then they're spoken of as a threat and then after a while it goes it goes it goes quiet and then whenever another breakthrough is made they're, they're, they suddenly become a threat again um yeah so that's the point i wanted to make hmm. that i think that's a great uh comparison uh as well uh and just in my view i just go back to to what was said on 60 minutes now they spent the first five ten minutes talking about how dangerous these folks are and cruel they are to their own people talking about north korea and then they go talk to the white military even though it's a black representative but they go talk to the white military for troops in south korea and they say, you know, hey, whatever North Korea does, they launch any missiles, you know, they decide they want to get tough. Uh, we will wipe them off the planet. There's no way you can tell me that you are legitimately afraid uh, of a group of people that, you know, we can wipe them off the planet uh, in the next five minutes. Uh, I don't think you could be legitimately afraid. I think whites like to do that sort of thing on a regular basis just to justify when they want to go be aggressive uh, and kill some non-white people. Uh, let's see. The last thing I'll make sure I get in, I wanted to return. I had mentioned Camp of the Saints, uh, this racist French novel. Uh, there was a white congressman in the U.S., a white member of Trump's administration 
who've been talking about this book and saying it's great and white people need to pay attention to this book. And the theme of the book basically is that non-white people will invade and ruin white civilization. Everything that they built up will just come in and ruin it. Uh, it references black people as niggers and we just want to come in and rape white women. It's similar to the Turner Diaries if you need, you know, a comparison. Uh, but just if anybody had any thoughts, because I think Mar uh, Maureen Le Pen, this is a French novel, has also recommended and talked about this book and saying, you know, this is something we need to, to focus on. This is our problem. Problem. Um, why do we think these books are important and do we think this is a reminder uh, for white people uh, someone even said if white people are not ignorant about racism which is the stance I've taken why do they even need a book like this uh, so that they know that the problem is non-white people and what have you uh, anybody want a response at that before we uh, get ready to wrap things up Um, can I say something about like the the need for those kinds of books? Yes, sir. This is Frank yeah. Fanon. I mean, I think yeah. This is Frank Fanon again. Yeah, I I, I think um, those books uh, may be relevant to to those. Um, I guess it's a kind of reminder by the right wing or like the the the, the, the yeah the, the ultra right wing white to their sort of center left or leftist sort of whites who who maybe they think are forgetting what they need to do <laughs> you know the 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 standard standard procedure of being of being white in this world um i think it's just it's i think it's it's, it's white people talking to, to each other and obviously we we obviously have to be subjected to watching the same news and so we we kind of get caught up in all of that. But I think, really, it's white people talking amongst themselves, um, just just basically reminding themselves of their roles, um, because um, just so, so basically to say like just because you're married to a black person or just because you you think Trump is a bad guy doesn't mean that you still shouldn't know what you should do as a white person if you had to do it kind of thing. That's that's my take on it. Um, I'll be, I'm interested to hear what others think. But, yeah. Um, can I be heard? Yes, sir, Andrew. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, no, I'm not. Gus, I'm not familiar with the book that you speak of. But what I would say is this: um, all books, in my opinion, right, written by white people, just like all media uh, 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 put out by white people. Is um is 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 really got a subtext, got you know got some uh, um uh, semiotic meaning, got some visual meaning, some hidden meaning, whatever you want to call it, and and it's just to basically put forward um, ideas about white supremacy. It's as simple as that. Um, whether or not it's overt or covert, you know, whether or not it's meant to hint or, or, or at the subconscious. It's, it's all for one purpose, you know, it's, it's just to, it's to propagate white supremacy, it, you know, a children's programs to propagate white supremacy to young children, um, uh, um, ideas of dominance for white children to, so that they can grow up thinking that they're the movers and the shakers and the controllers of everything. The sad thing is, is when we, is when, is when we as black parents, or if you like the first teachers of children who are women, um, when they buy these white books for for black children, white parents, white women, very rarely, if ever, buy media that folk, that has black figures, black children as a central figure. They they don't buy those books, you know, or they don't purchase that media for their children, you know. And and we need to stop <clears throat> purchasing this media for our children, you know. Uh, it's it's quite important. So, so anything they put out. It is going to be to <clears throat> propagate that central idea, you know. So, you, you know, you, you know, that's that, that's how I see it. So it doesn't surprise me, you know. I, I will check out that book that you say, um, but no, it doesn't surprise you know anything that puts them forward and whereby they operate as the central figure in the story, whereby they're the movers and shakers, and we are directed by them and told to move here, move there, sit down, stand up. Right? No, it it doesn't. None none of that surprises me. It doesn't at all surprise me. Mm. Good point about uh, being uh, 
mindful parents uh, about the content that we purchase for our offspring. Uh, did anybody else want to respond to this this sort of overt white supremacist literature? Uh, why this sort of content is available, what purpose it serves, and if whites even need these type of reminders? Yeah, it's true. And yeah, I 100% agree with the whole, you know, that there's always some sort of subtext. And, you know, it doesn't even have to be, you know, white people, um, sorry, black people just need to be invisible, you know, in order for it to to have the same effect sometimes. Because it's not, it's not, you know, what they put in, but also what they don't put in, if, that, if I'm making any sense. You know, that, that in of itself can also be... Um, you know, can be, you know, the, the kind of invisibility is still like a form of abuse, can be used as a form of abuse to kind of perpetuate, you know, that white people are, are you know, important and black people are not important, you know. And I have a, I have a, just just kind of reiterating the parenting thing again, um, you know, I do have this boundary with my with my daughter that, you know, when she's at school, you know, she sometimes brings, brings her stuff home from, from school that she has to, you know, that she's picked during library time or whatever and I say to her you know you can read that stuff when you're at school when you're at home with mummy we're going to read the books that I've bought for you i.e black history black issues with black characters in them because when a lot of the times when you you buy a lot of these books if there are any um, black or non-white characters in them they're always the friend they're always the friend round the back you know who they're never the central character um yeah, and it's it's you know I I talk to her about this stuff now. When if we do have the opportunity to to if she brings books home, we'll talk about the book sometimes, and I'll show her how racism plays itself out inside the book. So I'm you know I'm not just putting like a blanket statement saying you're not reading those books. I will you know when we get the opportunity, I will explain to her why the book is is um, inappropriate and how it perpetuates racism, and she she understands it. She's really beginning to understand it, and I think it has to. This stuff has to start at a young age, because our children learn consciously and unconsciously through this, through this education system, and what we do as parents as well. What we read to them is so important, and they pick this stuff up. They pick this stuff up. So we, as parents, as black parents, have to make a conscious decision to intentionally do the counter racist work with our children to show them that. This is what this is how it's going to be in our house. This is how we're going to do it in our house because it's important for for um, for them to understand that that black people and non-white people have contributed and still have got a lot to contribute to to um, to the world and 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 this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like, and it's important. It's important. Start start small, you know. Start small. I bought loads of books online. I couldn't get them in. In my local bookshop, I bought, I ordered loads of stuff from the states. There's so many books out there now, what you can buy, and they, you know, they don't cost a lot of money, but you have to be willing to put the work in, because, you know, these white supremacists don't don't joke with their with their white children, and they will lie to their children to get them to believe that, you know, that that whiteness is the be all and end all, and we have to tell our black children the truth about what that's about. And it has to start from from the cradle. So yeah, that's that's kind of my take on the literature thing. Here, here, outstanding uh, counter racist parenting. That is uh, super important. Having those conversations, being really mindful about what your uh, children are uh, consuming, and just having dialogue about what they're consuming. The content, the characters. Are there black people in the books? Or if it's, you know, something they're watching uh, on a screen, are there black characters? Are there non-white characters? What are they doing? What's their role? Very important. Uh, your children, our children, they can process uh, that information uh, consciously much earlier than we think. Uh, much, much earlier than we give them credit for often. Uh, they are uh, very smart, very perceptive. That has been my experience consistently. Um... With that, uh, as again, this is not our three hour. We did our 90 minutes. Uh, we'll be here next month. Thank God it will be spring uh, by the time that we do this for April. It'll be April 16th uh, for folks to already be in the know. April 16th, every third Sunday of the month is our global 
Sunday talk on racism, if there are other non-white people, other black people that you're around that you think it would be great for them to participate, they are welcome. Always uh, great to hear more black folks and grand that even Mr. Fox uh, calling in directly. Uh, We can get some of the folks to dial in that makes it a little easier for me and hopefully will minimize some of the uh, tech issues uh, if I don't have to to ring in 10 people. But uh, absolutely phenomenal uh, to hear from everyone. Uh, June Allen uh, and again check her uh, podcast I posted uh, the episode that she just uh, uploaded uh, where I was a guest on her podcast to discuss the late Dr. Francis Cress Welsing so glad we had the opportunity to do so again her birthday uh, just yesterday as well uh, but check out her podcast Miss June Allen uh, African 1884 joining us uh, from Austria always good to hear from you uh, Andrew persistent glad we were able to uh, get him in today uh, Frank Fanon joining us as well and uh, Mr. Fox who operates the YouTube channel gets a lot of the cows content uploaded to YouTube a lot of folks have been able to access the program uh, because they found it on YouTube super appreciative uh, for all of the effort and making the time and calling in today that is uh, fantastic glad we were able to get him uh, on the line uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing from all of you uh, next month hope everybody stays uh, safe constructive uh, as well as our callers in the states Thomas in New York and the other folks who uh, dialed in uh, phenomenal to hear from you all as well uh, and again encourage sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy and that's worldwide Uh, I don't think us being intoxicated uh, with an alcohol or a few brews cigarettes any of that uh, whether we're in England Brazil the US Canada South Korea I don't think us being intoxicated is going to work out in our favor anywhere in the world as long as white supremacy exists I think Dr. Welsing would want us to take phenomenal care of our health our brain computer so that we can crank out solutions to the problem racist man racist woman racist child uh everyone good so yeah we're good we're good we're good spectacular Thank you again for tuning in. Hope it was a constructive investment of everyone's, I guess, Sunday evening, Sunday afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, Creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Help us remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cow signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, What's your brother. Problem? You're a victim. <laughs> I'm a victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned.